We really are seeing an extraordinary level of cooperation right now between all stakeholders and uh, those on the workforce solutions side at the state level, uh, between the, those state level uh, people and the regional and local people, and then between the stakeholders uh, themselves at the local and regional level. And that's an incredibly important point because this can't happen. We can't, we can't find the workforce solution that we're looking for without that level of cooperation. I'm gonna repeat Mike just a little bit here and talk about the landscape that we're seeing. Uh, we are seeing, due to the low natural gas prices, enormous growth, absolutely enormous growth in the manufacturing industry. With that comes huge growth in construction, in transportation, utilities, other affiliated areas. In addition, we've got these really exciting developments going on in the high technology sphere with uh, those, those companies coming in, developing software, digital media, video game development, also some exciting developments in aviation and other types of manufacturing along those lines. And that's on top of some really solid growth fundamentals in the economy as a whole. So all of these work together to produce a situation where meeting the workforce demand is critical to capitalizing on our opportunity. And I really want to emphasize this. This is about being able to achieve that growth potential that stands before us. The great limiting factor to that growth potential is our ability to meet the workforce demand. But if we are able to meet that workforce demand, we are generating the energy, the engine of growth that will allow us to expand those growth opportunities into many other areas. As we, as we see this growth happen, as we achieve that economic growth potential, we, we will see our population grow as a consequence. We'll be losing fewer of our highly talented young people to jobs out of the state. We'll be able to retain those folks in the state. And we'll be bringing in highly experienced workers to our state to take some of the most advanced level positions at these companies. We'll see our population grow as a consequence of that. We'll see greater demand in healthcare, in education, in other fields like that. And as we achieve the growth potential, we then open up the opportunities for more of our community development uh, uh, jobs, the, the types of jobs that actually are taken by the liberal arts graduates and allow them to take a job in their field that, that they're really passionate about. So that's the vision that I want to set. That's the opportunity that stands before us, an opportunity to achieve enormous growth to provide opportunities for our young people to stay here in Louisiana, if that's what they choose to do, and to provide opportunities for them to take the types of jobs that they're really going to be passionate about and that will also allow them to create a great standard of living for their families. And then furthermore, to create the type of innovation, the type of uh, uh, culture of innovation that will allow us to develop the jobs of tomorrow. So how do we get there? Like I said, the very first piece of this is being able to produce the workers to support the growth potential that is immediately in front of us right now. And Mike had mentioned that, that uh, doing analysis of supply and demand and so forth is, is part of my job. And a lot of what we're learning right now is that we've got this massive growth in a few fields, and if we can't provide the workers there, we will see a limitation to the growth potential. We need to be able to produce a lot of workers in a few fields right now in order to be able to open up the opportunities for people in other fields. And so a lot of what we're seeing right now is a lot of highly strategic efforts focused on those fields. But that shouldn't be interpreted as the state will only ever care about engineers for you know, the foreseeable future, because that's not the case. But it's something that's incredibly important right now because we've got this huge growth in front of us. So our analysis shows that where we really need a whole lot of new graduates from our education system is at all levels of the education system. A really major gap right now between the supply and demand is in the industrial construction crafts and in the manufacturing operations positions that will be opening up as these plants get built, as these activities uh, actually come into uh, operation. So we absolutely must radically increase our production of uh, construction craft workers and manufacturing operations workers. 
and there's some tremendous activity with a lot of different um, uh, sort of revenue sources and a lot of different plans behind them at the LCTCS system to do exactly that. At the four-year level, we need many, many, many more graduates in computer science. I can't even tell you how many more graduates in computer science we really need. Engineering in all fields, engineering technology at both the two-year and the four-year level and above. We also need uh, data analytics people. This is something that's very interesting. This is a relatively new field, but people are being employed in data analytics across almost all the industries that we have here in Louisiana, from oil and gas to healthcare to the IBMs, the CSCs of the world, and so on. Data analytics and banking, I should mention that as well. Data analytics is becoming really the wave of the future. And it's the type of data analytics that's really highly quantitative and typically associated with heavy duty business programs or the computer science programs themselves. And then finance and accounting. As these operations are getting underway, there's a lot of need for really sophisticated technical finance and accounting people. So that's a lot of what we need in terms of new graduates. But one thing that's incredibly important to recognize is that we also need a lot of experienced professionals. And part of that will entail recruiting people here to Louisiana. One of our priorities at LED is to uh, bring back what we call our expats, those young people that we lost to the brain drain over the last few decades and have gained really terrific experience in fields that matter here in the state. We want to be able to offer them the opportunity to bring their families back here or to come back and raise their families here if that's what they want to do, and we know a lot of them do want to do that. So that's one of our priorities. But we also need a much better pathway across that wall between graduation and taking the job. We need to be providing our students work experience, relevant work experience, while they're in school, and we need good apprenticeship models that will allow people to transition effectively between the end of their education and the career that they truly want, the, the real career trajectory that they want. And so some of the solutions that are in place. Uh, Mike mentioned the WISE Fund, uh, Workforce and Innovation for a Stronger Economy. This is an incredibly exciting project that we have here because it involves all of the systems of higher education. It involves the Workforce Commission, it involves the Workforce Investment Council, and us at LED. So it's a truly cooperative endeavor to make sure that we're structuring our incentive programs in higher education to produce the types of increases in graduates that we really need. So it's designed to be very targeted, really towards those fields that I was talking about earlier, identified by the gap analysis as uh, the, those fields that are really going to help generate activity in our economy. Really exciting moment for that. Uh, the jumpstart. Uh, program at the high school level is, again, providing alignment to the workforce priorities that we see. And the mechanism for that is through the credentials recognized by the uh, IBC Council, which is part of the Workforce Investment Council, industry-based credentials that have been validated to provide a major difference in employability to a young person. So there was a, a real uh, energetic uh, process earlier this year to really analyze the IBC list and make sure that we get it right because we knew that that, that was going to drive a lot of the activity behind Jumpstart and create career pathways that really will, that really will provide uh, students with an opportunity to take a job that will provide a good wage to them and where there will be a, a number of open positions to them. Um, there's uh, a number of activities that have been coordinated effectively to use federal funds, such as Carl Perkins, uh, effectively to focus on these high priority jobs. That involves coordination between uh, the Department of Education with the, uh, the high school level, as well as LCTCS. And it's been really gratifying to look at that process and see how well coordinated that's been and how everybody's working together to make sure they're focusing on the right things. Um, Certainly the, the Workforce Investment Council and the uh, Workforce Commission has been a great partner to us and to uh, higher education and the Department of Ed in all of these activities. And there's a lot of stuff that's rolling down that I, I think we'll hear about in, in a little bit uh, to the local and regional levels. 
And then we have a lot of activities going on with our regional economic development organizations, many of whom I see here in the room. And my team, I've got Ray Berger here from my team who helped to develop the certification for manufacturing or C4M program in response to the needs of Louisiana businesses. And he's been working with Vic LaFont from SLEC down here in order to really get a good understanding of where the major workforce gaps are here in South Louisiana. We know that there's a huge number of them and really develop a plan to create robust solutions there. So we're really excited about that project and we'll be working with a number of our other regional economic developers uh, to make that happen. So that's, that's the vision. We've got a lot of solutions in place, but again, a lot more that need to happen. And I look forward to, to hearing your questions a little later. Randall Domain, Louisiana Workforce Commission. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to be with you uh, today. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks uh, on, on Region 3, which is terrible and huge assumption of parish, uh, which is my battlefield uh, every day. And of course, the, the, the opportunity we have here has to do with supply, labor supply. We want to increase uh, the number of skilled workers in this area. And part of the solution to that has to be to grow this workforce locally. Uh, early on, we met, met with uh, South Central Industrial Association, South Louisiana Economic Council, and some of the larger employers in this area to discuss it. And you know, we all agree, absolutely, part of this workforce uh, has to be grown local. Uh, and this is what we, we, we started to do to attack this. Uh, we, do a, we, we go around and do a presentation uh, called Reality of the li, li, uh, Region Free Labor Market. Now, this is geared toward uh, students. Uh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, th this is geared towards students from grades 8 through 12, their parents, and people who are underemployed. Uh, and, and what we've been doing is, doing is we're showing them, look, if you train for a, a particular skilled occupation, and we're talking uh, uh, skills such as welders, electricians, ship fitters, pipe fitters, machinists, you know, if you train for one of these occupations, this is the potential uh, salary you could earn, you know, as compared to a job with no skill. You know, we'll show them different, different comparisons. And then we'll show them the, the opportunity to get trained in those. Some of these, uh, some of these skills, the training can be in as, as little as six weeks. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about college degrees, what college degrees are, in demand in Region 3. We absolutely do not want to discourage any child from, from pursuing a four-year degree, but what we want is for them to have their eyes open, you know, when, when they engage in, uh, in higher education. Uh, so what we've been doing is we've been doing a lot of these presentations with uh, faith-based groups, uh, and that's actually starting to uh, pay benefits. Uh, Reverend Roland Price, who, who you meet later today, was one of the first. We, we went and did a presentation to his church maybe three months ago, four months ago. And ever since we've done that presentation, he calls me at least twice per week and, look, I have people looking for work. This is what they can do. Do you have a, a place to place them? Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's starting to pay benefits there. Uh, we've, we've recently made headway uh, with the school systems. Uh, doing their career fairs. We're scheduled to meet uh, with a group of an entire class of eighth graders at one particular school uh, uh, within the next month or so. And again, you know, we just want to show them these are the opportunities you have if you want to live and work in, in uh, Region 3. These are some careers you, su you should consider. And the careers we discuss, of course, are those that are expected to add uh, the most jobs through, through 2020. Um, we recently had, a, an, we have an advisory council, a group of employers who meet with us, and we want to improve the, the presentation. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to start showing a, a lot of photographs of, of some of the ships and some of the oil field equipment uh, that, that gets built in Region 3. Uh, we're going to talk to them a lot about the, the newer technology 
a, a, these, a lot of these young people were raised on technology that we weren't exposed to. And some of this is actually being applied now with, with some of these uh, skilled jobs. So uh, it's all about guerrilla marketing in this area. You know, I wish I had a five or ten million dollar advertising budget because this would be easy. But um, you know, we're just doing it by word of mouth. We're doing presentations, uh, and let me offer this to you: if you have any group that you want us to do a presentation to, please contact me. We're we're more than happy to do it. Uh, Mr. Barker here from Bollinger Shipyards has come to some of these and talk to them about. Uh, about the shipbuilding industry in particular, and they respond uh, really well to that. Um, another thing we have is, is uh, Region 3 was awarded a part of a national emergency grant to uh, place uh, uh, dislocated workers into skills job training with companies. Uh, a dislocated worker is normally someone who was laid off from a job and does not have a reasonable opportunity to, to find another position in the job he was laid off in. Uh, it's, it could also be a, a homemaker whose, whose spouse uh, lost the job. There, there are a variety of categories under dislocated worker. But what this grant does is it'll uh, pay up to $4,000 of the training salary while um, he's being trained. Uh, and if there are any employers in here who are interested in that, uh, please you know, let me know and we can, we can talk to you about it. But it's a good opportunity to take someone who has no skills, introduce them to an industry and let them get some training. And of course the employer gets a, a little break on paying that trainee's salary. Um, the other thing uh, that's going on with the Louisiana Workforce Commission is the um, the website, laworks.net, the, uh, the hire system where a person goes in to register uh, as someone looking for a job has been changed to where the jobs are ranked by stars. They're, they're uh, one through four stars or five stars. Uh, five stars are the jobs in the most demand that pay the best and it, it goes down all the way to one star. So. Uh, you know, a young person can look at this and, and when he's, he's thinking about a possible career, he can do a search to see what jobs are really in demand. Uh, another excellent tool, you know. So uh, again, just to reiterate, in, in Region 3, it's all about uh, public awareness about what jobs are actually in demand here and what jobs pay well here. You know, if you want to have a, if you want to have a career, you want to have a family, you want to build a home, uh, buy a nice automobile, these are the areas you should look into. And again, some of the training, it, it takes as, in as little as six weeks, a person can be trained and, and go to work. So um, with that said, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions whenever we're ready to do that. And so you'll see that we have a number of other groups who are involved besides government groups. And Brent Gullinger, of course, represents the Louisiana Mid-South Oil and Gas Association private sector group that is engaged as well in this process. Brent? I think um, it's interesting because uh, this is, as you mentioned, my first foray into workforce development issues. Um, I thought I had done a decent job of uh, kind of covering that fact up, but in the introduction when Michael referred to us as workforce development experts, I saw a number of people that I worked with just shaking their heads violently. <laughs> Jimmy uh, just got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and anyway, what, what I was uh, instructed to, to kind of speak on today is a memorandum of understanding that uh, Moga just signed this summer with the state. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. With the state. That the vision is pretty simple. Uh, implementation is going to be a little harder, but what it aims to do is to create a field-oriented, practical curriculum and certification system that will prepare tomorrow's deep water offshore workers for tomorrow's issues. Sounds easy enough. This is how we came to this decision to do this amongst our membership, or going through this step. We started looking, I mean, anything you read in any newspaper, any business magazine, whatever it may be, mentions that the Gulf of Mexico is in fact the most attractive offshore play in the world, right? And it's only gonna get bigger, 
we're looking at a 28% increase by 2022. That's startling. That's, that's an eye-opening number, and it's only going to get bigger. Along with that, we're going farther and further and further than we ever have before. That demands new technologies and technological advancements that are happening rapidly. Add in the regulations that we've seen, and y'all are all familiar with them here, the regulations that have come forth lately are a lot more technical, a lot needs a lot more know-how. So that got our attention. We started thinking we need to take a look at this. Adding to all that, our workforce has something that colloquially in the industry we call the big crew change. Some expectations say we're going to lose 40% of our offshore workforce force in the next decade through retirements mostly. So all, adding all that up rec made us recognize we had to do something. So here's what we did, and I'll be very brief. Um, I know I'm the last act before Springsteen, so I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. Hey now. But, but first off, we, you know, we surveyed our members, get an idea what the game plan was currently, what we were doing, what they were doing to get their workers prepared for offshore. We got the information back and we got a lot of interesting uh, narratives from that in that there wasn't a streamlined way that offshore and oil companies designate or certify their workers. There was different degrees of the requirements needed for different companies, which, which was interesting and not something we were expecting. So with that, we then interviewed uh, all, the, all the different state agencies, both, both the ones here to my right and a number of schools to figure out what currently was going on. And we were, we were honestly blown away. There was a lot of really, really good programs out there that in a lot of cases, maybe we weren't aware of. And so it kind of tilted our focus a little bit to say maybe we can just marry this better. We can connect what's already existing, what we need as an industry, and go from there. We don't have to recreate the wheel. In a lot of cases, we have those programs that can uh, solidify the worker that we need. So through all that and those iterations, we kind of realized what the MOU does, it sets up that conversation that we're now having with those different entities in the state, both in the state agencies and at the universities, to figure out what that curriculum needs to be in order to prepare those workers. And as an industry, it's, it's become obvious to us kind of the things that we can do to better assist the schools are, are three things uh, in general. Number one, we can have a better handle on the curriculum on what it is our companies are going to need for tomorrow's offshore energy worker. We also can supply the equipment with these rapidly changing technologies that I discussed. These things can get out of uh, season in just a few years, and we need our students to be working on the up-to-date equipment. Uh, also, we're going to look at, we're going to need help in recruiting the right uh, faculty to teach these positions. In a lot of cases, this could be retired uh, offshore workers like the ones I mentioned in the uh, great crew change and we're going to need to have a more uh, hands-on approach with that but uh, you know it was it's been about a year to get all this in place and we just did sign the MOU I believe it was last month uh, maybe the end of July so we've gotten to that point there's still a lot left to do but I think it was an important milestone to get there and at least have us all on the same page and at the same table in order to uh, continue going forward. There's going to be some issues, some challenges that we still foresee, but I think together, collectively, we'll be able to achieve that. And I'll be happy to answer any questions as we go into the Q&A portion. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> and from Bayou Petit Caillou, Senator Norby Chavez. I promise you I will not sing Dancing in the Dark. <laughs> <laughs> but how, speaking of Springsteen, how many of y'all out there have ever heard Born in the USA? Bruce Springsteen, great song, right? I mean, I'd be ashamed if, if you hadn't heard it. How many of you, knew, of you knew that was a song that was actually the plight of the American worker who did not have a job? Everybody thinks that's a great American anthem talking about how awesome it is to be from the U.S. When, when in reality, Springsteen was talking about the challenges that were facing the Rust Belt and areas of the country that were having to deal with those, those pains of having produced a commodity that for whatever reason was no longer needed in that area or maybe in this particular country. And we really did a, a crew change of, of taking the American worker and exporting him to foreign countries where the wages were lower, the, ma the materials were cheaper, the legal and tax climate was better, 
and we saw so many folks go overseas. Well, I'm, I'm really excited that that is not a situation that we're facing here in Louisiana. Even though in many of those Rust Belt states, they are still struggling with extremely high unemployment with really, really skilled workforces. Uh, one thing that we have to do uh, to address this is something that, that, you know, not only Susan touched on with recruiting our expats that have gone to other states, be it uh, Texas and Houston and Dallas, San Antonio, but also in Georgia and Atlanta, uh, even in Alabama, Florida, some of the areas where opportunities that were not here during the 80s and the 90s, are, are, uh, they're, 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 they were there. That paradigm's kind of shifting now. I, I, uh, Mike alluded to when I graduated in high school. Of my 10 best friends that I graduated from high school, I, I'm not kidding, this is not an exaggeration. Eight out of 10 of, of, of those best friends live in Houston, doing jobs that didn't exist here when they graduated either high school or college. Now, you know, they're approaching their 40s. Uh, she also alluded to that great wealth of knowledge that they now possess from working in these areas. Uh, I'm proud to say that two of those eight have already moved back to Louisiana and one scheduled to come back before the, before the beginning of the year. Now these are guys that had entry level positions in all field service companies that are now, in, in some cases, upper mid management that are coming back to Louisiana. Uh, I have a tendency to, to kind of see the whole board on issues. Uh, I think somewhat out of the box. And far be it for me to act like I'm an expert in you know, workforce development or economic development or whatnot, but one thing that uh, I do have the privilege of is serving as the vice chairman of the finance committee where you have to see the whole board. Uh, we handle the state budget. I'm never going to forget when I called former chairman Francis Heitmeyer uh, when they wanted me to take uh, the vice chairman's position. I said, Francis, it's not like when you guys were there and the state coffers were overflowing with money. I said, we broke. He says, it doesn't matter. Everybody has to come to you. I said, but we broke. I may not want to hear what those people have to say when they come to us. He says, it does not matter. You will learn more about the state of Louisiana by going through their budget with a fine tooth comb. You, it will make you a better leader for however long you're there. And you're going to have the best chance to improve the state. And what that has enabled me to do is, is see the areas of, of the state where resources were being allocated that they shouldn't have been. We trimmed some of that fat. Some places we had to cut it down to the bone uh, just because that's the way our Constitution said we had to do it. We find ourselves in a very, very unique moment in our state where we have so many good things happen, and yet there are so many challenges that face us, okay? From, from a local government standpoint, right? Let's take Terrebonne and Lafouche as an example. We're experiencing unprecedented growth and have been for almost 20 years now in the oil and gas sector. With, with the development of Port Bouchon, with the expansion of deep water drilling that continues to grow, they go, as Brent said, we go deeper, we go farther. More service companies are popping up left and right from all over the state and all over the country. I had the privilege to accompany a local company to the Eagleford Shale. That's in far west Texas, just outside of San Antonio, a little place called Kennedy, Texas, where ConocoPhillips just built a campus that will rival any you'll see anywhere in the country. It's beautiful. There ain't nothing in Kennedy, Texas. <laughs> It's a challenge for our local governments like Terrebonne and Lafouche that have the lowest unemployment in the country, that have all of these companies with positions opening everywhere to do every type of job in the oil and gas sector. And then you have the majors that are making campuses here, BP, Chevron, Hunting, the list goes on and on, more coming. So the highest wage earners in those respective fields are going to have to come here to Terrebonne and Lafouche Parish. Why am I telling you this? 
Because there's an aspect to all this that people aren't, aren't thinking about. Because they think if you build it, they will come. Yeah, that's true. But what about that person that you really, really need in that high-skilled field that's living in Katy, Texas? He's got two kids and a wife in the best school system in the country with the best daycare, the best after-school sports activities. They've got high school football stadiums that look better than our stadium here at Nickel State University. How are we gonna get those expats back that are on that line, that are marginal, that wanna come home, but have really gotten accustomed to all those amenities and those quality of life things that, you know, makes them pay that high, high, high property tax. We need a shift. We need to start focusing on quality of life issues in our areas. In Terrebonne and Lafouche, we couldn't do that. We're, we're the, the, the southernmost parishes in our state when you take Plaquemines, Birdfoot out of that equation. The challenges of coastal erosion and hurricane protection were paramount. We couldn't build a road because we had to build a levee. We couldn't improve a school because we had to build a levee. We couldn't make a movie theater because we had to, we couldn't incentivize a movie theater to come because we had to build a levee. We've addressed those issues. Lafouche Parish is one of the best lower levee systems in the entire country. Terrebonne is building one that will rival it, if not supersede it, and we did it with local tax money. But what that does is it strains local government's ability to address infrastructure needs. What do you do when you're in a community that's seeing a 15% population growth for roads, Pat, right, that aren't supposed to uh, handle a community of 125,000, they were built to handle a community of 60,000. And this is happening overnight. So the challenges that we face in workforce development and reattracting people to Louisiana is a across the board issue. There are several areas that we need to get active in and we need to begin to address. And those of you who work for companies that are doing work in the area, uh, you know, I encourage you to, to uh, Randall, correct? Do, do what Randall did. You know, go out to some of those non-traditional, listen, anybody that has a job can go to the local school and throw a job fair and participate and that's great. But you're gonna miss some of those, those uh, young people that may not be at school that day, that may not think that they're on a the track to go to a two year or four year school, but you know where they're gonna be? They're gonna be at, at, at Reverend Smith's church or the community picnic or whatever it may be. Reach out there. Community groups that are doing uh, local beautification projects for, an, for a community. Listen, no young couple's going to want, want to move into a dilapidated downtown area or a, or a cookie-cutter uh, home, even though they're making great money at a great job with a great company, if there's nothing to do, if their surroundings aren't pristine, if the education system isn't great. So you've got to look at those things. Another thing that I'm going to touch on, and Mike gave me the, the, uh, the signal without <laughs> giving me the signal to wrap it up, Coach. One thing that was touched upon is the skill of engineering that is in such high demand here. We only have a finite amount of engineering schools in the state of Louisiana. Texas triples that number. So let's use a, 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 a random number. Let's say that our engineering schools at UL and uh, LSU and, and wherever else they may be, may be graduating 200 engineers a year. But we need you know, 16,000 engineers today in the environmental sciences, not only the petroleum sciences and the construction sciences. So where are those engineers gonna come from? They're gonna come from Texas, right? So we have to pivot from an educational standpoint on where we're gonna be offering the, the degrees. There's no reason schools that are right here in the middle of uh, the action, so to speak, like Nichols shouldn't be offering engineering but we're not. We did in the 70s during our last boom, okay? Calcasieu, look, Calcasieu Parish in Katy, Texas. They're gonna, they're gonna struggle with the same problems that we're gonna be struggling with across South Louisiana, and that is attracting quality people to areas where they have an opportunity to not only learn to trade, but learn it where they're gonna be working. Not learn it two hours away 
and have to commute either through an internship with a company they may have a lead with working for, but actually in the community, getting the on-job training that these survey companies, these DO technical companies, these engineering companies want. They want to hire someone that they bring into their company, show them this is where you're going to work for the next five, ten years. This is the work you're going to be doing as soon as you graduate. So that's just another area that we need to work on and we'll be on our way. And it's, it, it's great to be a part of this panel and it's a great uh, to see all of you willing to engage on these discussions.